Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming and welcome to this Impact Week panel, Confronting the Digital Divide, EdTech Innovation for Educational Equity. Uh, we're so grateful to have you here. My name is Madeline Spolin, and I'm a full-time MBA candidate at UCLA Anderson and one of the directors of Impact Week. And I'll provide a brief intro on this special event and where we'll explore a really important and timely topic how edtech platforms can improve student learning, and the ongoing relationship between technology, educational equity, and how COVID has impacted that relationship. Uh, this event has been organized as part of UCLA Anderson's Impact Week, an annual conference that celebrates our community's commitment to creating a more equitable, just, and sustainable society. And Impact Week is organized by UCLA Anderson's Impact at Anderson Center and the Net Impact MBA chapter in collaboration with partners within the business school and across the broader UCLA community. This event is co-sponsored by the Entrepreneurship Association and special thanks go to Ellie and Bhavna from Impact at Anderson and Daniel and Pranav for their support. And today we're really excited to welcome Mariana Aguilar, uh, Kim Sabria, Kiana Patterson, Melissa Mills, and they'll all be panelists and the panel is moderated by Russ Altenberg. And I'm gonna introduce them a little bit. And then you can also check out the Engages platform to see their full bios. Mariana began her career in education as a teacher and currently serves as the Director of Research at GoGuardian. And she brings a wealth of experience in ed policy, educational nonprofits, and previously worked as a consultant. Uh, Melissa Mills, is the child of two public school teachers and was interested in education from a very young age. She's actually zooming in from Oslo, so we're very lucky to have her, uh, where she's a product manager at Kahoot, which she transitioned to after many years working at Google. Uh, Kim Sabria is the co-founder and CEO of Edpuzzle, a video learning platform that helps teachers and students create personalized video lessons. And he's originally from Barcelona, Spain, where he worked as a teacher in Spain's Teach for program. And then Kiana Patterson became, began her career as a teacher and now works as a VP of Strategic Development at Hop Skip Drive, a social enterprise that offers safe uh, transportation solutions for youth, particularly well. And finally, uh, our panel will be moderated by Russ Altenberg, the CEO of Reframe Labs. And he is help, runs a nonprofit startup studio that helps underestimated founders build innovative new education organizations uh, that work to help kids. So before I hand this off to our moderator, I want to note that you can submit questions via the Q&A box in our conference platform. And again, thank you so much for coming. And now I'll pass it over to Russ. Thanks, Madeline. And hello, everybody. I am uh, so excited to help kick off Impact Week at Anderson. I uh, recall back to my days as an MBA student, we didn't have a center for social impact back then. Um, it's really incredible to see how Anderson has grown in this important area. And uh, I applaud all of you who are using your time, your talents, your energy to help create a more loving and just world. So today we're gonna to chat a little bit about education equity, the digital divide and ed tech innovation. Uh, for those of you who do know me, these are areas that are near and dear to my heart. We all know it's been a very, very difficult year. Globally, over 3 million people have lost their lives due to COVID. 140 million have battled the virus. Nearly all of us have been forced to change the way we live, work, learn, We've had 52 million school-aged kids at home. A big chunk of them, about 15 million, were not connected, according to the FCC. So just think about that. Take a moment and think about what your life would look like this past year if you didn't have internet access. It's an understatement to say that the pandemic has exacerbated existing inequities in our school system. In LA, we're facing a devastating education crisis. Uh, in fact, last week, the Wall Street Journal editorial board released an op-ed titled Education Tragedy in Los Angeles. I encourage you to check that out. Now I'm hopeful uh, many schools across the country are reopening, including here in LA, uh, but it's clear we cannot simply pick up where we left off. 
uh, reopening alone won't address the recovery that is needed. So in Kiana, Melissa, Keem, and Ariana, we have several leaders from organizations that have been at the forefront of supporting kids and their families during this crisis. Um, so that is the scope of the conversation today. Uh, wanna remind again, everyone that uh, we're live streaming and if you have questions, uh, we do wanna take them. Uh, sometime at the end we have for Q and A, but um, do submit those questions via the Engage platform. All right. With that, let's jump in. Uh, I'd like to kick things off by asking each of you to share how COVID has impacted you, your family, uh, and the work of your organization. Kiana, let's start with uh, you. Yeah, thanks, Russ. I'm so glad to be here with you and all of uh, my co-panelists as well. I think um, none of us uh, can say that we haven't been affected uh, both personally um, and professionally because of the last year. Um, uh, from a personal and professional or personal uh, standpoint, um, my 92 year old grandmother who's in Seattle, Washington in a nursing home, uh, she survived COVID. Uh, she did contract it while she was in the nursing home. Her, um, her roommate did not, unfortunately did not uh, uh, survive. And so this was, um, you know, very near and dear and, and uh, a personal, uh, really close to me. Um, professionally, um, you know, our work, Hop, Skip, Drive, is really about uh, innovative transportation and mobility and bridging the gap between the opportunity of kids being able to go to the best school, their school, uh, getting to after school activities. Um, and obviously nobody has been going anywhere for a greater part of the last year. Um, so our business did essentially kind of ground to a halt. Um, we, we got innovative. Uh, we started doing things like delivering of uh, devices and food and, and seniors and other things, but it did definitely greatly in, impact our work. Um, and I think just from a broader standpoint, um, because of my work and really looking at um, uh, solutions around inequity in terms of mobility and how there is such a huge gap between um, opportunity and access, I really started asking myself is if essentially what uh, COVID made us realize is that we had placed a lot of band-aids on things, right? We have placed a huge amount of band-aids and while mm -hmm. a band-aid really helps to, you know, uh, stop the bleeding if you scrape your knee, it doesn't stop the fact that people keep on falling down and scraping their knee. And so if we just keep on handing out band-aids, we don't solve the real problem. And I, you know, have gone deeper within and started thinking about what are those ways that we can actually solve the problem and no longer have to give out band-aids. And I think that is, is, you know, the greatest thing that I can take away from this last year is like, how do we really, really lean into changing and, and having a huge paradigm shift? Um, and as you said, Russ, not going back to the old way, but um, forging a new path that is more equitable and more just for all students and educators. Thanks, Mariana. Yeah, I would echo a lot of what Kiana said with regards to how this has had an impact on everyone. Um, I think for me personally, this has definitely been a time of transformation and reflection. Um, I, my husband and I have the tremendous privilege of being able to work remotely. And we've actually used this as an opportunity to um, travel around the country. And it's been a great opportunity for learning and reflection and seeing different ways of living. Um, and I think this has been a really critical part of being able to um, understand the impact of COVID uh, across the board from small towns and small communities to large cities and the way that this tragedy and pandemic has impacted the lives of so many people. Um, for me personally, a lot of people in my family actually contracted COVID and I feel very grateful that, um, my sister and my stepmom both survived and are overall healthy. Um, I think that with regards to, as an organization where we're at, we really recognize the importance of being able to support educators and students at this time. Mm -hmm. And so last spring, we made all of our products free until the end of the school year for new customers in order to really make sure that we were able to be there 
for districts, for educators, and for students. Um, and actually, this spring, we've continued to make Beacon free for the rest of the school year out of recognition that even as schools and districts are going back to school, there is a tremendous need to support districts in their ability to support students' mental health needs. Um, so these are a couple things that we're doing and have done as an organization. And then I would also just kind of highlight another key piece, I think, is that we so firmly recognized how critical it was to be responsive to the shifting needs of educators at the time, right? As educators were shifting to move online, something that no one had ever seen before at this scale, we really doubled down our efforts on collecting feedback uh, from educators and were able to roll out some new features to support teachers, like adding audio to Pear Decks to make sure that students continue to have that teacher-student connection or rolling out video conferencing and GoGuardian Teacher to ensure that teachers and students could have direct opportunities to communicate directly in our products. Mm -hmm. So I think for us as an organization, it was really about making sure that we continued to work really closely and double down on those efforts to make sure that we were connecting with educators and meeting their needs. I'll come back to the, you know, the shifting needs you talked about and and uh, your decision organizationally to make uh, that product free. That's interesting and uh, want to hear more about that too. Melissa? Um, hi everyone, um, based in Norway now. Um, definitely, I think everyone's been impacted by COVID. Um, on a personal note, I haven't been able to see my family for the last year and a half. Um, so they've mm -hmm. missed, you know, birthdays, you know, even potential pregnant right now so we're expecting one due and they won't be able to my grand my parents won't be able to see their grandkids so totally understand i think that's something we're all kind of experiencing right now um from a business perspective from a company perspective working at kahoot one thing we've immediately seen is that our product was initially built for an in-person experience where you have a whiteboard and everybody in the classroom and we had to quickly shift and make changes to our product that could accommodate to this more virtual environment and this new normal that we call the hybrid learning. So um, that's caused us to shift a lot. But again, what's great is I think like everyone here, there's just been an incredible amount of adaptability. Um, everybody's kind of really trying to um, make this situation work. And, um, you know, I, we're hopefully, hopefully there's a light at the end of the tunnel and we can see how this new normal is going to play out as well. And on, on, on my end, I uh, also, just like Melissa, but the other way around, like I kind of travel to Europe uh, and see my family, uh, which is tough and I don't know exactly when we'll be able uh, to see them. Um, lucky for me, nobody close to, to me has uh, experienced the, the, the virus, which I heard is horrible, um, so I, I consider to be very lucky um, in that area. Um, and as well, I, I, I want to remember like also the social injustices that we have lived this past year. Like, it's not like um, there were anything new, to be honest, but something that coming from outside the US, I, I had to learn, um, unfortunately. And uh, and I think that, what, that, that was also a, a combination of, um, of multiple things that, to be honest, have made this year very difficult for, for a lot of people and um, in many different ways. Um, professionally, um, we, we are a startup. Um, so uh, we were between 20 and 30 people when, when we started to see like uh, the usage in Hong Kong explode. Um, and we started to like, our graphs started to show um, that we had to pay attention to what was happening in Southeast Asia. Um, and then suddenly when we started to see Seoul, Italy, and we knew the US was, was next, um, we, it was a lot of pressure and responsibility. And you have to understand that we, we were like a 20, 30 um, people company trying to help teachers use video in a remote environment, which is basically what we do. So we were at the, at the center of, of the pandemic, trying to help as many teachers and schools adjust um, 
in a with a lot of pressure for for many different people inside um, the district organization and we tried our best to support as many people as possible just like a hood or go guardian we we try to provide free resources to as many schools and districts around the world as possible. Um, but even though like that's that's not enough, we're just a tool or a platform um, changing the behaviors of parents, students, teachers, creates a lot of frustration. Um, not having access to internet just for 1% of your class and even higher for, for different environments creates a lot of tensions um, and and we had uh, to provide the best service possible during this time. Now, um, obviously we, we are excited to see what we can do. We have an important role and we, we don't take that for granted. And um, yeah, we, we are obviously trying to bring help to all these situations that we are fully aware of. Thanks, Keen. So let's go right to broadband and digital literacy. Um, we know the pandemic sped up the shift to digitization. Uh, we also know that, you know, the FCC is telling us one third of households, 15 million kids nationally, didn't have access to broadband. They were left behind this past year. And of course, addressing an issue like broadband, that's a massive challenge for education institutions. You know, I know, Districts and organizations uh, were giving out hotspots in different places. Um, some chose to create hubs for internet access. Um, others chose to give out like vouchers um, to relieve the financial pressures of, um, you know, for families trying to get connected, but they can't change broadband infrastructure on their own. And so I wanna put a couple of different questions on the table uh, before I go to you, Marianne, to kick things off um, to get your take on, um, on these. So question that's top of mind for me is like, should broadband be a public utility or should we let private companies like SpaceX try to solve this problem or something in between? Um, what policy recommendations may help close the digital divide? Mariana? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to even think about it. Um, in this way. I think we're talking about a really complex challenge here, obviously. And so I think my personal perspective here is in the power of partnerships and that's solving a problem like this it is really complex. And so it really requires kind of public and private partnerships to develop solutions that enable us to deliver. So I could imagine things, for example, like um, offering tax incentives to private companies that provide broadband access in these communities. So you're kind of leveraging um, the strengths of government and the strengths of the private sector as well. I think whatever policy recommendations are put in place though, are it's really important that they're grounded in some kind of core beliefs. And I think these core beliefs are five, there's five core beliefs that I think are really critical to call out. One, remembering and keeping in mind that not all students have that equal access to reliable internet. Obviously that's the foundation. So any of these policies need to be rooted in that core understanding. Second, that inequity extends beyond just access to the internet. Mm -hmm. Technology literacy varies drastically amongst individuals, families, and communities. And students' ability to access digital learning experiences that are therefore also impacted by the kind of um, technology literacy that they have access to. Third, I think that we also have to think about digital instruction as a related but distinct competency that teachers may or may not be getting um, sufficient levels of support in. And so when we think about developing policies for addressing the digital divide and broadband access, we also have to keep in mind that these policies should be recognizing that there's another key component to this. Fourth, I think there's this important component to any policy, which is to keep in mind that it's not just addressing a single solution. Schools were always designed to provide more than just academic instruction. They were community hubs. And one of the biggest things that students lost was not just the ability to access academic experiences, but also mental health resources, a hot really? meal. Um, and then fifth and finally, I think that 
we've touched on this already, but any policy again needs to recognize that these inequities existed before and the digital divide is just an exacerbation. And so when we think about designing policies to address access to broadband, I really think about it in two categories of one, supporting teachers and incentivizing funding for additional staff and kind of professional development that enables teachers to really gain the support that they need around um, leveraging instructional technology to develop those 21st century skills, and then those private and public partnerships for ensuring access to key resources. Other thoughts? Russ, I want to jump in. Um, you know, again, not to date myself, um, but, you know, probably 10 plus years, I was traveling to DC and meeting with USAC um, and meeting with the FCC, trying to get the FCC uh, to expand E-rate, mm -hmm. to expand what school districts and libraries already have access to, to be innovative and to essentially move with the times, right? So, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was all about getting drilling holes in the cement and getting T1 lines into schools. Before that, it was something else, right? And so I think one of the challenges that I have as we think about, you know, um, leaning into whether or not this should be a, a public utility or not is really see, to, to look at the framework that we have right now. There is money that exists. And we need to shift and change uh, current the current pot of money that enables school districts and libraries to, as Mariana said, to be this hub, this community hub. And you can't be a community hub if you believe that a community is in one building alone. Right. That it, there's four walls that surround a community. And we know inherently that just isn't true. So I think that. We have to look at the FCC and what USAC has been unable to do because of the rules of the FCC. And that would be a, a whole pot of money. And I think that like we have to be creative and innovative around like what does to, to Mariana's point, what does equity look like? Right. If you hand everyone a T-Mobile hotspot and you assume that your hotspot is just like the line that I have or SpaceX or Starlink in my home, we have another thing coming. So we have to think, is this apples to apples or is this apples to oranges? Because then we'll just be playing the equal game versus the equity game. And I don't want us to get into that space. And then I think the, the, the third thing that I, I want people to be thinking about as we think about, you know, access is, is really considering what does it mean if we say to everyone, we want you to provide internet access to all homes, all families. And then we look at the struggle. The real struggle is that some families, let's say you give them a voucher or Spectrum or Starlink or anyone says, sure, we'll give you a rebate. We'll give you a discount. We have a, millions of households that are underbanked and, and unbanked, have no credit card, have no credit. So how do you get over that hurdle if you do that public-private partnership? So we have to look at all of this, this the, the sort of, community uh, problems, the, the, the social fabric of the community and look at all the things. If we are requiring schools to be this community hub, right, then we have to fund it, one, like it's a community hub. Mental health, food, housing, all of those things have to be considered. And then we have to think about what happens when kids don't have water at home when they don't have washing machines and dryers. We've seen across the country where principals will buy washing machines and dryers for their schools so that it can reduce truancy, right? These are the real challenges that our schools and our leaders are faced with. And they're just, they're just solving the problem and they're putting a Band-Aid on it, but it doesn't actually inherently go deep. And so I just want us to consider sort of the, you know, the entire, what's, what's under the umbrella, and what, what do we have to unpack to think uh, innovatively and think ahead? I love this Band-Aid metaphor. You know, it doesn't prevent people from, you know, continue to fall down. Uh, so, so I'm hearing it, you know, infrastructure is not enough. I'm hearing, you know, digital literacy is, you know, we should be thinking about that um, holistically as part of this. I know in LAUSD, they gave out 10,000 hotspots for remote learning, and yet only 40% of LAUSD middle and high schoolers were um, 
you know, uh, disengaged from uh, classes in 2020. Uh, some parents had never used email before the pandemic. Um, some didn't really know how to best support their kid when it came to remote learning, right? So what are some ways we can, you know, expand and build digital literacy skills for both kids and, and adults, given that hybrid learning environments are likely to stay in some form going forward? I can jump in, but I, <laughs> but I want to give other people time to share it too. Go ahead, Mariana. I think of it in threefold, and there's a couple of programs I would shout out here. I think I think about digital literacy for educators, and then I think about digital literacy for communities, and I break that into two. So for digital literacy for educators, I think the Ideal Institute out of LMU is doing some really excellent work with regards to how to support educators in developing not just how to use technology, but how to use technology in the classroom in really innovative practices such that they're not just substituting the analog experience, but actually transforming it. I think about digital literacy for communities, and here you see an exploding market in the learning and development space in corporate learning. And so I think there's already a tremendous move when you look at folks who are employed by Fortune 500 companies that are making these investments. But I think the question then becomes, how do we also uh, highlight the importance of investing in learning and development and upskilling your workforce for small businesses and for nonprofits and for um, other organizations where the parents of our students in lower income communities might be employed? And then lastly, I would actually really encourage us to think outside the box a little bit, because I think there might be a need to create new mechanisms or types of institutions specifically focused on digital literacy. So I think about some of the work that Los Angeles Trade Technical College architecture program is doing with green maker spaces, where they're actually creating spaces for folks to develop key skills, including digital literacy, while solving issues and challenges that are being faced by the city. And so they have a partnership with the mayor's office. So, so folks have an opportunity to um, engage with challenges in their local community, co-create solutions while developing key digital literacy skills. And so you have this kind of workforce development solution and this maker space type of program. So I think those kind of really creative, innovative types of solutions are going to be key to our ability to kind of upskill the digital literacy levels in communities across the board. I want to bring uh, Keem and Melissa into this and, and to chat a little bit more about the ed tech boom that has kind of paralleled, you know, this digital divide challenge we've been talking about. We know the learning apps, those have boomed in the pandemic. VC funding for ed tech startups almost tripled from 4.8 billion in 2019 to 12.6 billion in 2020. Kahoot raised 215 million, congrats, Melissa. Um, we've heard person after person say that COVID was this great accelerant, right? Accelerated the adoption of digital education tools by like five years. So talk a little bit more about your organization. Um, what kind of growth did, did you all see during this pandemic? Um, I know, Melissa, you touched on it a little bit in the intro. Uh, talk a little bit more about uh, what that looked like in detail. Yeah, um, so for Kahoot as a product, uh, we, I think a lot of people have commonly used it in the classroom where a teacher would be presenting and then students would have either Chromebooks or mobile devices where it would almost be their remote in which they would input their answers really quickly. Um, the product has a bit of a viral effect because it's so engaging and it's, has that kind of really active user activity and engagement um, in that classroom experience. So the hardest part was honestly translating that to um, handling this in this new digital environment. Um, there's two things we did to the product to really improve that. The first one was um, we're actually currently working on an integration with Zoom. So um, now you, rather than having to have these two devices, it's just all gonna be on one screen. You can use it on a mobile device. You can use it on a desktop device. Um, we're trying to really just simplify that overall process um, that's really necessary in digital. And then the second piece is we focused a lot on building out the game so it could be played 
um, offline or asynchronously. So if a user couldn't potentially participate, maybe because of internet issues, they could always then complete it as a challenge later when they did have access to internet. So um, it was really important for us to make sure that we could have the, um, we could accommodate the diversity of use cases now that we experience with the product compared to the very more singular experience, which is in this more real time environment. Um, that was really critical uh, for sure. And then part of that too, is we've done um, acquisitions to help accommodate that. So we acquired Poyo and Dragon Box so we could help in improving that online learning experience with even younger students who might be tougher to play. Mm -hmm. So um, we've tried to kind of broaden it as much as possible. Um, like Kim, I'd love to hear your thoughts, how your company's doing it too. Yeah, um, on our end, we didn't raise a massive round of funding. <laughs> um, by the way, congratulations, obviously that's always a good sign for all the ed tech ecosystem. But on our end, we, we got many um, schools and districts invest during the summer on Edpuzzle. So we took that as a round of investment for Edpuzzle and we allocated all those resources to improve our customer support um, team. Um, so we multiply by four the team in six months. Um, just so that we could provide the, the support to all these schools and districts around the world. Um, we, we focused less on product because obviously our product was, um, let's say, ideal for the remote learning environment where students can learn through video at their own pace, respond to questions, and then the teacher gathers the information asynchronously. And then they can use Zoom or whatever other platform to, to engage with the students. But obviously it's helpful because if a family has one device and the students have to learn uh, whatever they have to learn at home, it's better to have videos that they can watch at their own pace um, instead of having to all jump on a Zoom call at the same time, which is impossible. Um, and, and we focused a lot on, not as much on teaching how to use Edpuzzle, but more on how Edpuzzle can help in different environments and we understand not everyone has multiple devices or great internet speed at home. Um, you might be teaching elementary students, it's very different from high school students. So we focused a lot of our resources to build um, very simple and uh, action-oriented professional development for teachers um, and as well for administrators on how to support teachers because obviously um, they also receive like angry emails from from parents and, and teachers. So um, yeah, we focus more on the support side than the product side. And um, it has been very intense, but, um, and obviously there are more things that we can do as a company to um, make sure um, technology amplifies the positive impact of a teacher and it doesn't become a barrier for some students to access it and amplifies negatively um, and 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 yeah we we obviously again we are, we are a startup so um, there is a limit on on the things we can achieve on a certain period of time and responding to the previous question that you mentioned I think um, that's why I think uh, government spending needs to be like laser focused, which sometimes is not, and I'm not an expert, but um, coming from, from Spain or Europe where uh, we're more used to social policy, uh, um, so socialist policies, um, I think uh, internet access is, is uh, almost as, um, as important to, to education and, and this, and, and not just for the pandemic, like before the pandemic, um, we, we knew it was important, but it, nobody was talking about these numbers as much. But now that the pandemic happened, like um, it seems to be like the first thing we need to fix. Um, so I, I hope it creates sense of urgency. And even if schools open, um, they, they take this as, as something that needs to be fixed as soon as possible and not in the next uh, 10 or 20 years because 
not just the schools are changing, but the the jobs and the companies are changing. Working remotely yeah. needs to be a skill that um, is going to be a must. Um, and if students cannot learn those skills, um, it's it's going to be very challenging for them in 10 or 20 years when they go into the workforce. Right. Anyway. Can, can I pick up on, you know, we're talking about existing inequities and uh, I'd imagine across all academic progress indicators, students of color, low-income students, English language learners, foster youth, students with disabilities, uh, homeless students, those students have been set back further than their more advantaged peers. Um, I'd love to hear what your organizations are doing to support our most vulnerable kids right now. Mariana, you, you touched on it. Um, you know, one of the ways your organization is approaching it, but um, uh, Kiana, I'd love to hear what Hopskip Drive is doing and, and Kahoot as well. Yeah, so we really obviously leaned into um, meal delivery, um, device delivery. Um, a large portion of our work pre-COVID uh, was to support students with IEPs, students experiencing homelessness or McKinney-Vento students and foster youth. And as we know, these are uh, our vulnerable groups of students that were already facing challenges pre-pandemic. They already had low high school graduation rates, low performance rates. So there was already challenges there. So we as an organization really leaned into how do we support the school district the communities and the families to get them the things that they need, be it food, supplies, devices, you name it, we were doing. Um, and we continue to do that. The, the, the interesting thing as more and more schools go back um, in person, we're seeing a, a, a sharp increase in the amount of need uh, that school districts and other organizations uh, need for us. So as we know, many people have been out of jobs, uh, you know, um, and so that increase is um, housing insecurity. There's going to be more students who are facing um, housing insecurity and who are going to be identified as McKinney-Vento. How does a school district respond and react to that? And so how do they lean into us being able to quickly ramp up and provide that mobility and transportation, whether it's to that learning pod area, right? And we know that um, LA Unified opened up several locations across the, um, the county and, and the city here um, uh, and those weren't sort of their school of origin. So we were transporting students to those learning centers that they can get extra resources. Um, but like I said, again, we are going to see and we have already seen a massive in, uh, uptick in the need to support, especially those who are experiencing um, uh, housing insecurity. And we want to be able to continue to do that work. Um, absolutely. I think one thing that we experienced at Kahoot with the with the change with the whole coronavirus situation is um, a large increase in our international usage as well. So um, Kahoot's a glo we're globally covered. We're um, used by over 7 million teachers globally. So not just the challenges in the US, but how can we make sure our product scales to these other markets in Asia and Europe and, and um, South America as well. And one thing we've really tried to focus on is about basically language and translation. Up until last year, everything was predominantly in English. We've been working on translating the product, but then what's really powerful is we have an entire database of Kahoot content made by all these different um, different um, creators, and it's all in different languages. We have roughly 50 million Kahoots in these various languages. So we're really trying to find a way to kind of reach that international market and get that content and get that information to as many people as possible, and not just necessarily on an English first basis. Um, we also acquired a company called Drops to Language Learning App. They, they have 42 languages. So we're really trying to kind of increase that diversity to make sure that, to your point about this equity divide, that, you know, even beyond the U.S., we're trying to accommodate where we can. And then finally, we've really tried to also just uh, make improvements like students can get accounts for free. We have a basic account offering that's always for free. We've really always tried to kind of protect that offering and even enhance it and improve the functionalities there over the last year, because we know this is just such a critical time for our users. Any other thoughts? I want to go back to parents and uh, parent empowerment as a part of this. Um, I think one of the things that have come out of uh, 
COVID is that it caused many parents to realize that they may have been over-reliant on sort of like one system node of learning for their kids, so the school district. Um, now, you know, many are better consumers of learning for their kids. Um, so I just want to kind of toss out one, a jump ball here. Like in what ways has your organization, like how have those relationships with parents changed because of COVID? And what can we do to better support those parents as stewards of learning for their own kids? I know Kiana, you're, you're starting a charter school yourself. I'm sure you have thoughts on this, but I welcome uh, what your other organizations are doing. Yeah, I, you know, I think that, um, you know, really leaning into, again, what are the things that parents and families need, right? Is it food? So, um, you know, I, I, have, I like to say sometimes I have friends in high places and, and one friend is at the USDA and, and, and in particular, I, I, I mentioned to this particular person, I said, you know, prior to COVID, we could not give food to kids outside of the school grounds, right? It was free and reduced lunch, right? And then you had the summer meal program, but the kids had to eat the meals on the campus of the community center where they were going to be having those free uh, lunches. And so one of the things that I said is like, as we think ahead, right? Um, what, what does the USDA think about actually supporting uh, free and reduced lunch or free lunch for all? And the question I ask is, if we believe that the central part of learning is textbooks and materials and learning resources, and we do not require parents to pay for those in our public system, school systems, then why do we require food? Why do we require the parents to provide food for their kids, right? And give them money to pay for food if we don't force the parents to pay for the textbooks or the Chromebook? or whatever one-to-one -one device that we're going to give, right? It's just a, a paradigm shift. So I think for me, um, as I think about, you know, being on a charter school board, thinking about um, my own other charter school that we're trying to get open here in LA, it really is thinking about at, at the heart of this is what is it that the, the parents and the students need? And so one of the things that you asked earlier was, about you mentioned that there's been this real uh, large disengagement. And my only question to everybody is why? Why have children and families been disengaged? Is it personalized? Is it culturally res responsive to them, right? Does it meet the needs? Does it actually, in fact, make them dream, hope, imagine the future for themselves, right? Relevant. Does, does it happen for the parents as well? Whatever we're giving, whatever in the public school system we are giving to families and communities and students and parents, does it enable for parents in the community to wrap around and say, I can get into this vision for my child, for my community? And if there is a gap, then we have to ask ourselves why, right? And so I think that is a real challenge for us is that we have to lean in. If parents, if, if, if kids are disengaged, it is, our, it is our challenge to ask ourselves why and to do everything possible to bring them into the fold, make them a part of the decision-making team on what is best for their children. And so for me, that's the parent empowerment piece, right? Centering and rooting our learning and, and education in the community and the needs of the parents and the children. And if it is not with them, we are going to lose them. And we saw that. Thanks for that, Kiana. One Other thoughts we, on this one? Yeah, like, um, one thing we've seen in our product is an increased usage of cahoots from certain partners and publishers. So uh, typically companies like Marvel and Disney or Angry Birds will sign up with us and they'll have some sort of learning component. And um, we actually get a lot of feedback that parents are using this now. Um, a lot of parents are trying to um, teach and coach along with the teacher and informing the student content, but a lot of times they're, they're not practitioners. They don't, they're trying to figure out what to do. We've actually seen a huge usage of just parents using and relying on these cahoots made by these companies to do like algebra or um, learn about, you know, basic literature with Cinderella, for example. And so that's been really interesting because it's an opportunity for both the parent to understand how to teach, but then also cover it in a way, in an environment that's really interesting for kids as well, since they're all familiar with a lot of these characters. 
Um, so our big focus has been really around kind of the content component and making sure we're curating content specifically for parents to help with kids. Um, that's just kind of another kind of trend we've seen on our side for sure, um, at least from a product perspective. On, on our end, and I'm going to jump in because I, I disagree a little bit with M Melissa. Um, it's it's uh, at least when when I was a teacher, it was very hard to ask the parents also to do the job, the, the part of the job of, of the teacher, because they had like two or three jobs. They got home really tired. Maybe they didn't speak the language, and it was very hard for them to help the students that on whatever they were doing in class. Um, so in our end, like what we're trying to do with the videos is that at least you can watch the video with your kid. Um, that doesn't require you to uh, know the topic. Um, you just have to be there to support, to be curious, to try to understand together, let the student respond to the questions and then um, have that safe space so the student can, can develop and, and learn at their own pace. Um, however, when it comes to parents, I don't think the, what we should ask them is to also do the homeschooling approach. Sometimes maybe they explain math incorrectly and that's even worse for, for the student or um, they cannot even help or they cannot be there. So um, I, I think it's more in terms of trust. Um, like, again, it's very hard to ask for trust uh, when maybe the, the school system hasn't helped them at all. Um, so, so it's, I, I think it, it, it's almost like a social um, commitment from society. And again, it, it's not like, oh, um, we're going to get better results in the SATs or something like that. I think it goes beyond that. Like what, what type of industries does the U.S. wants to focus on? And I cannot even vote those things. I'm not from the U.S. But um, I think like if we all align to a vision for uh, the society, we agree that the education is going to help achieve that goal. We try not to change every two years that goal and try to focus on something else. That's when I think um, things can change and it's a very difficult thing to change. Um, but I think that begins with trust from, from the families, which unfortunately has been damaged this past year. Um, and I, I'm, I honestly, I don't have the response. I know exactly how to get that trust back. Yeah, it has been damaged. I mean, we've seen parents and students leaving school systems. Um, you know, they initially left not of their own choosing. And now they figured out how to like um, kind of survive on their own. And because to Kiana's point previously, you know, their school district or school system wasn't really meeting their needs very well before they're like, I don't know if I want to go back to that. And so you're seeing this massive funding crisis that comes with that when you don't have butts and seats um, at those schools. Um, I'm on the board of a nonprofit called Speak Up Parents. And one of the programs that they launched um, in response to COVID is called the, the iFamily program. But um, it's essentially um, teaching digital literacy skills to parents so that they can better support um, their kids when it comes to uh, remote learning. Honestly, teaching things like how to use Zoom, uh, the different functionalities with that, and the basics of some of the different um, adaptive software and Schoology that their kids were being asked to use every day. So there are things like that that start to, you know, maybe can build some of the trust, but I think overall there's a big kind of customer service problem that, uh, you know, our, our districts are facing and uh, we'll continue to face even with some of the ideas that you know, you're talking about now. I do wanna call out what I perceive as a tension uh, when I think about ed tech business models. And so, you know, this is right up your alley. Um, this tension between running a financially sustainable business and then meeting the needs of our most vulnerable students. And how can education companies, whether it's, you know, private pandemic pods, online tutoring services, adaptive software offerings, how can they ensure that 
their products or services um, aren't exacerbating inequity simply by catering to more affluent families. Yeah, what a great question. I think this is absolutely um, a really important topic to touch on. And I think for me, I would say that the first and foremost comes down to how you operationalize mechanisms within an enterprise to ensure that this is not something that happens uh, systematically. So for example, at GoGuardian, we are firmly committed to evaluating how our products propagate bias and to putting into place solutions and processes to ensure that is critical because you can have a group of people who are believe, who are who all believe in something, but if you don't operationalize it, it doesn't ensure that it becomes integral into how you do the work that you do. The other things that I would look to are things like offering certain tiers of products for free. So we have our basic free version of Pear Deck um, that's oh. free and available to folks. Um, please excuse me, that was the uh, boat that just went by if you heard that. I am near the water. Um, anyway, so I think being able to make sure that products are available for free. Also thinking about things like, for example, uh, our premium products, our premium Pear Decks, some of those features that when a user starts to use them, if they build Pear Decks that have premium features, those features are still accessible in those Pear Decks, even beyond when the premium trial runs out. And so I think it's about intentionality. It's how you operationalize those protocols within an enterprise and then how you think about how those manifest and how you build your products, how you sell your products, and how you run your organization overall. Other thoughts on business models? I, I, I'm I building my response as we go listening to Mariana because she's obviously smarter than me. Um, the, um, I, I have like, uh, on the one hand, I think it's important to have like um, affordable prices so that you, you do not exclude um, like certain districts or schools. Um, so that's something that we had to learn obviously um, through the process because it's not the same as school in Texas and a school in Rhode Island, a school in California, Los Angeles or in California, Palo Alto. Um, and even inside Palo Alto, you have obviously different schools with different needs. So um, having a business model that understands uh, diversity of customers and users is uh, key because otherwise it, it, you're only going to reach a small amount of customer. On, on the other hand, I think in order to have a positive impact, um, I, I, believe, I believe the, the business model needs to be aligned um, with, with having um, a more positive impact the more schools and teachers you have, no matter what. So, the more diversity your users have, the better it is for the community. So for example, mm -hmm. for Kahoot or for Edpuzzle, the more teachers we have, the better content we're gonna serve to our users, the more data we're gonna have in order to target better which content you need to reach. Um, and I think that if you design a business model that has that into account, you are incentivized mm -hmm to get as many schools and districts as possible and not get to the 1% or 5% of the schools, but 100% right. of the schools. So I think it has to do with that as well. Yeah, I would just say like to riff off of that, it's really, have you identified a big enough problem, right? And if you've identified a big enough problem and you have a solution for that problem, then people will be willing to pay for it. Now, depending on what problem you've identified doesn't mean that that problem is the same for everybody. And so thusly your solution won't be for everybody. I think the core principle to whether or not an ed tech company, and I can say this because I've been in several, uh, you know, uh, ed tech companies is you'll know when you have, uh, you know, st starting at the foundation is who's on your team, who's designing the, the pro who's sort of 
accurately designed and, and sort of identified the problem and then who's designing the solution and then who is who are the people who are going into schools and working with them on on those uh, those problems and those solutions and I think if at the core you have a diverse group of people who have many different skill sets and experiences right who come at that problem, with a, a, a different um, take on it, then you're likely going to be able to land on something. And if you don't, then you're going to be faced with doing things like, well, I'm just going to send this out and then parent, parents can download the app and you know do X, Y, and Z. And then when you realize, well, a lot of parents don't have a cell phone or they do have a cell phone, but they have limited data right? that they, they pay by the minute. Probably all of us here have an unlimited data plan right? And that you don't even think about your cell phone bill because it's on auto pay, right? There are families and communities that don't, their, their cell phone bill isn't on auto pay. And thusly, their phone might be off because they haven't put, they haven't added more minutes to it. Thusly, they don't have any data. They can't download the app. They're not going to get the text message from the parent, from whatever app or whatever is sending home messages. So I think that there's a lot of things out there that force technologists, all of us who are on the business side, to think about what are the inherent problems, right? What happens when you have slower internet? What do you do, right? So what does Kahoot do or GoGuardian do when it understands that this is on a slower connection, right? What do you do to your system that enables people to still be able to use it and strip things down, whether it's load balancing or whatever. So now I'm putting on my techie hat, right? So there's things like that, but a lot of times people don't come to that with that thinking. So um, because they think, well, everyone's internet connection is just as fast as mine. And so the assumption is that, so they build for that and then they hit roadblocks. So again, it really does matter about who's on your team, who's identifying the problems and then who's developing those solutions then you'll figure out your business model from there. I wanna um, hit some of the questions coming in from the audience. Uh, thanks and keep those questions coming on the Engage platform. Uh, one touches on um, President Biden's American Rescue Plan and I'm gonna, there's a couple that are related so I'm gonna combine it. Um, so the American Rescue Plan provides roughly 120 some odd billion in new flexible funds for school districts. They can spend this over the next three and a half years, uh, the largest ever one-time federal investment in K-12. Uh, so the question I'll ask is this, if you were a district superintendent, what would be your funding priorities to help close the digital divide and empower parents and learners? You can go a lot of different directions with this one. have been here. Um, I think that's an excellent question. I would say that first and foremost, the funds that need to be spent really need to be localized to the unique needs of each district because a district in rural Alabama might have very different needs than an urban district in New York City, right? And everything in between. And so this question of how would I spend it? I'm just going to kind of zoom out and let's say kind of some principles in general. So one, first and foremost, <clears throat> excuse me, I would say really investing in programs and services that are proven to drive outcomes for all students is really, really key. Um, second, I think back to this point that I made earlier, really making sure that we're supporting our educators at this time, because educators have had to wear the hats of so many different people, counselors, social workers, they've been the primary point of contact for students to schools. And so making sure that we're supporting educators with really high quality professional development experiences, as well as funding for those additional resourced roles so that teachers themselves aren't trying to fill these additional roles. I think that's really, really critical. Um, I would also say I'm going to make a quick plug. Um, I am moderating a panel on Thursday with D Doug Meskar, Philip Lavelle, Stephen Yanni, and Tom Murray. 
um, some of whom are really remarkable, all of, all of them who are really remarkable individuals, but policy leaders, superintendents. And so if you are interested in hearing about that, do, please do feel free to sign up on the GoGuardian website. And it's on Wednesday, sorry, not Thursday, if I said Thursday. See, I want to find out which of them you, you thought were not remarkable. That is, uh, <laughs> no, all, all that, remarkable. That, that'll be... <laughs> some are policy leaders, some are superintendents. <laughs> Um, we have, uh, thank you for that. Another question coming in from Anna Pena. Hello. Um, all right. So hybrid is here to stay, uh, because of COVID. Um, what is the biggest challenge of hybrid education models? Um, what do you think is the most important thing? Those of us who are supporting these educators to your point, Mariana, what are the most important things we need to keep in mind given the uh, continuation of hybrid models going forward. I definitely think leaning into what Mariana said, what works? What are some, some proven outcomes based approaches that work? Um, and that work that we know work along the entire um, sort of gamut of possibilities. Does it work rural? Does it work urban? Does it work in between? Does it, does it work when there's a parent who's highly engaged sitting next to the child? Does it at the same time work when the parent isn't engaged? So we have to lean into the things that, have a, that work across a diverse ecosystem, schools, households, et cetera. And if we don't know that, don't buy yet. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the, the responsibility of the decision maker to lean in and to ask those uh, companies, show me the evidence that it works in under these conditions. That's what we have to make sure that we do. I see uh, Mariana, she's saying yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, Melissa, go ahead. Um, no, I totally agree. I think um, one of the biggest challenges we have is like the whole point is just whatever we build needs to also scale. Um, like you're talking about all these different use cases and then we're trying to accommodate these teachers. Um, actually, I feel like Kim, you brought this up with the fact that there's so many inconsistencies within the US around how schools educate, but even globally, it's even more, there's just more use cases. So like from a product perspective, when we're building um, whatever feature we have, it's challenging sometimes to figure out how maybe a small child would use it who doesn't can't read and doesn't use numbers, for example, for multiple choice, or maybe somebody who's limited or not as tech savvy, who's only familiar with the Microsoft Office environment because that's what their school uses. Um, so we find that in order to just do something like offering a quiz product, it has to work across all these different use cases and all these different places on the internet. Um, and that alone is, a, is just a big challenge to work on, but that's kind of the objective of what we do is whatever we build, we want to make sure it can scale and it can kind of support to these global use cases as much as possible. So a small kid could use it to a, you know, more advanced higher ed university student could use it as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm just going to add a small detail. I, I think responding to both questions, the Biden funding and, and making the hybrid model work and it's a leadership um, from whoever gives the money or receives the money or implements the money or uses the money to use a platform in the classroom. Every, like, I think it's very, very, like we have seen it before the pandemic and at the beginning of the pandemic that the schools that hadn't, didn't have a clear plan, it was all over the place. Some teachers using Kahoot, others using Edpuzzle, others using um, whatever, doesn't matter. Like the you have to imagine the confusion for the students and the parents having like 20 different ways of learning, one with Zoom, others with video. So um, I think it's leadership. Like if you have the money invested in something you believe in and commit to it um, and measure it, track it, make sure it has the expected outcome if it doesn't learn and improve. And when it comes to a school, if you're in Alabama, California, Texas, I don't care, to make the hybrid model work, you need to commit and have leadership inside the school and the district and, and commit to a certain way of, or having like some guidelines on how hybrid is going to be taught for the first year. Uh, some teachers will not 
enjoy that. But if if we give freedom to everyone and everybody is going to try to implement a different hybrid model, then it's um, when problems are going to arise again and it's not going to work. Teachers are going to give up, and that the at the end of the day, who's going to be impacted are the students. So to respond to both questions. I'm not in charge of the leadership of the budget and the Biden administration. So whoever is there, they better have a clear idea and understand very well. Hope, hopefully they have smart people making decisions. And when it comes to at the school level, I also hope they have strong leadership because they will need it. I want to stay on strong leadership as we draw to a close here. Uh, I want to put two questions on the table um, as you guys kind of ponder some closing remarks here. Uh, one, so without naming your company or that of any, anyone else here in this panel, uh, what ed tech company are you most excited about right now and why? The other question is, uh, what can school leaders do today to better prepare our kids for what the world's going to look like in 2030 and beyond? Great questions, Russ. Um, I think one company that really excites me, has excited me for a long time, and when you shared in our uh, private intros that you worked with them a bit a long time ago, I sort of fangirled out. Um, Khan Academy, I think that saw Khan's work as a founder, his incredible story of resilience from the get-go, and just commitment and dedication to the mission is so incredibly inspiring. And then to see how they have met the needs and scale, there was just a piece that came out about them a couple of weeks ago and how they're using Zendesk to ensure that they're troubleshooting and meeting the needs of their customers in a really responsive way. And I think this is so, so core to being able to ensure that we're, we as an industry are having an impact. And so I think the work that they're doing to enable self-directed learning and to provide resources that students can access uh, on their own is really tremendous. And then to layer on the piece here, we talked so much about parents as being a core part of the learning ecosystem. I can't tell you the number of times that parents have reached out to me and said, hey, you work in ed tech, what are some resources that you would recommend that I use? I just, I'm sitting here with my child and I need them to be able to engage with content and Khan Academy. I'm like, it's free, it's high quality and the work and the experience is awesome. So I'm just a huge, huge fan of Sal Khan and his work at the organization. So really incredible that you had the opportunity to work with him, Russ. No one else? I, 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 will, I will say I'm, um, I'm, I'm really inspired by um, things like what Kaya Henderson, who's uh, the, uh, the former DC chancellor, um, um, thinking about, again, personalization and also culturally responsive uh, curriculum, um, her startup reconstruction. Uh, there is, um, you know, just a number of other companies that I think are really leaning into this idea of like, how do we ensure that we have a, a diverse, uh, inclusive group um, who is building uh, the, the problems, the, the solutions of today and for tomorrow. Um, and, and so I'm really inspired by those teams that continue to just lean into that. Um, and, and I'm also inspired by, I, I think definitely like Khan, who's been around for a long time, who continue to do excellent work, um, you know, and others who are doing similar type of work, but really analyzing what are the core challenges and the problems that our schools and our communities are facing and how do we solve those for once and for all and not a Band-Aid. I, I don't have like a, a, a specific startup. I have um, learned a lot about what teachers are doing in in countries where where the access to internet is is even harder. And I know I have seen startups using radio to reach students in the middle of the desert, um, TV. Um, like I always say the best technology I have ever seen is a book. Um, so, or, or writing um, and, and 
I admire all all these um, entrepreneurs that probably don't have like a billion dollar company or anything like that. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about the innovation in the classroom coming from teachers that understand better than us what happens in their class and, and coming up with creative solutions with what they have. And it's our job to try to reach as many of them as possible with cool tools that hopefully will make their day better. Um, but yeah, I, 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 we have enough problems inside the company to be exploring what others are, are doing. Uh, so I, I cannot give a specific name. Um, I definitely think there's technical limitations in making products easy for everyone to access especially when it comes to students and student information. Um, it's been incredible how adaptable everyone's become. I think everyone's had to kind of, you know, roll up our sleeves and figure out how to make our products work in this new normal environment. And I expect the same will change after 2021 and the product will probably evolve and user behavior will probably evolve. Um, in the U.S. specifically, I know there's the company Clever that makes that focuses on SSO integration specifically within schools and for students, and it's um, a really seamless flow that I think, like I, I always, I think that sometimes the simplest flows are the hardest to technically build, and it's clearly done in a really intuitive way. So they've put a lot of thought into it, and it just makes it easier to access different products without, um, with while still making sure you're com we're compliant with all those policies. So um, there's not just the challenge of getting access to the internet, but once you have the internet, how can you make sure that users can access the content in a compliant way? And um, it's great that there's companies that are focused on that as well. Thank you all. As we draw to a close here, uh, just wanna thank everyone for tuning in on this timely topic. Um, and certainly Keem, Mariana, Kiana, Michelle, um, thanks for taking the time to um, talk more about your experiences and share your expertise. Um, as we reflect on educational equity, my challenge to anyone watching is to think about your networks. Think about the ways you might be able to harness the power of your company or your platform to help kids and families in your neighborhood, especially black, brown, or poor. It could be mentorship, right? It could be field trips or company site visits. It could be apprenticeships or internships. Uh, it could be advocacy on a critical issue like home broadband for students. Um, it could be education on an important new skill. But don't be silent. Use your power and influence to help those who are being left behind by our digital economy. Uh, you'll be blessed in ways you won't even anticipate. Thank you all. Um, back to you, Madeline.